Okay, we are live with the, the great and powerful Dr. Corey Peacock. We've already been over his name, so we're not, gonna, we're not gonna talk too much about that, only to say that it might be the greatest name in the history of names. That's it, you can't forget it. That's the, whole, that's the beauty behind it. Yeah, Everybody if it was ever a Peacock name, right? Exactly right, so yeah. you can't forget that. So we just went over that. This is what you guys missed. We went over that. We went over when we met each other because I find it more it, increasingly difficult to remember where the hell I met people as well as whether or not I've met their actual cellular collection or their pixels on screens. And, and, I, can't, and I think with the, I have met your cells. My cells have been in the presence of your cells before. That's right. You know, in, in, in a... In a good light, if you if you think back, I was able to you I was in with the Black Zillions down That's in right. South Florida. You guys came down for an FRC in Tampa and invited me up. So I came up there, did the certification. Right. That's right. We watched some fights together. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Day. We watched the man, if you remember what fights we watched, that would be crazy. I don't remember. So that means it probably wasn't any of my guys at the time. Yeah, you were a little relaxed, or we might have been drinking. I can't recall. We we had a couple beers in in that case. Okay, so yeah, that was a good time. Remember, that was at that that beautiful that uh, that house on the water there that we had for that weekend. Yeah, so that that was cool, man. It was one of those good things, you know what I mean? We're in the same place, same time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, it was good to be able to be able to share some ideas, share share a couple beers, watch some fights, hang out, that kind and, of thing. And shout out to On It. Yeah. Right. Yeah, for sure. Who you're associated with and those great guys out there. Right. I All see. right. So now you, you brought the something Westside up. Barbell, huh? Oh yeah, yeah. Shout uh, out to uh, shout out to those guys as well, uh, fellow Ohioans. Oh, are you from Ohio? I'm originally from Ohio. Yeah, small little uh, small little town called Tiffin, Ohio. I would okay. say in terms of where Westside is, the Columbus area, I'm probably about an hour and a half northwest of there, sort of in the middle of nowhere. Okay. Okay. But now you're, you've been in Florida for years now. Yeah. I've been in Florida eight years now, 2012. All right. So let's start there because when we did met me, you were with the black zillions and I don't know people that there's a lot of people listening to the podcast possibly who are not MMA fans. And if you are, you can lose my number right now. No, I'm not sure. I'm joking. Uh, uh, If you're not MMA fans, so the black zillions was like, that was kind of a hodgepodge team put together. Am I correct? Yeah. Other teams. Yeah, I, th- I think at the time, and again, I joined them sort of, honestly, when I came on staff, it was honestly sort of towards the demise and the end okay. of the team. Okay. I mean, I think I was with them for about a good year and a half, possibly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think it was a little mixture, some guys from American Top Team, some guys from Albuquerque, like Rashad Evans and those guys that were at Jackson Wink, mm-hmm. um, you know, and, and then it started to really evolve and grow. I think in the South Florida area, you just have such a a high level of the different aspects of martial arts anyway, in terms of the BJJ scene, judo, wrestling, and things like that, where people come down here because, I mean, why suffer during training camp? Why be miserably cold? Why be up in the city? You know, those kind of things. It's it's an easy, it's an easy location for them to come down here, suffer in training, and then enjoy everything else around them. Yeah, because if people have no experience with MMA athletes, I mean, you have experience with a lot of athletes, as do I. I don't know that I mean, all athletes train hard. I don't know that any have the psychological pressures that would accompany a, a, a combat sport athlete, which would no, speak no. to the idea that being happy during a training camp uh, is, is imperative, right? Yeah, I mean, that, that's exactly it. It's just, it's pressure all of the time. I mean, it's, you think about just fear in its simplest form, I mean, Anybody that's ever gotten into a fight, just take it as basic as possible, going out and, and fight your buddy down the street. The pressures that come along with that, people watching and people observing, and I mean, they're doing this on a daily basis with their training partners, you know? You, you take it to its simplest form, that's, that's what it is. And I mean, when you think about high stress, I mean, back in, at one point in human history, for example, if, you know, you were on the shorelines doing whatever the fuck we used to do back then, hunting and gathering, and an incoming boat came. Mm-hmm. Like your, your adrenal access went crazy because right. any incoming boat means shit's about to go down. And I thought that, I thought that way the first time I, I visited New York city, I don't know if you've ever, you've probably been to New York city. Yeah. I'm sure. 
but I felt that I was like, there's something still in us that when we are surrounded by people, there's like a little defense mechanism until you're comfortable. Mm -hmm. And nowadays you walk in New York, there's 50 billion people and you don't think anything of it, but I'm pretty sure that evolutionarily the responses are still the same. Yeah, so if you have sure. that many interactions, your adrenal, you know, everything's going to go crazy. And in an MMA fight, you're literally trying to bring out all of those chemical hormones and, and it's, it's it's the ultimate stress. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, you know, it's cool that we're, you're actually talking about that. Um, we did a research study. So, you know, I, I know you know this, maybe people watching. I'm also an associate professor at a university down here in South Florida, Nova Southeastern University, um, where we have exercise and sports science, both undergrad and graduate. And we actually recently did a study on this um, where we we did some genetic stuff. I'm actually trying to pull it up here as we're sitting here. Um, for those that aren't familiar, there's something called the COMTG. Yes, this and is it's a very interesting topic. Yes. Yeah, and, and people that have probably heard of it, you've probably heard it known as the warrior warrior gene, right? It's yes. that idea of how your body responds, like you just said, under these stressful situations and, and hormonal control and, and all of the different repercussions that you go over under a stressful situation. And we actually ran this, it was 20 MMA guys. I want to say there was about 15 uh, current or previous NFL football players and then college age active controls. And we found that with our professional fighter population, that there was a significant higher, like almost P of like 0 0.002. I mean, significant as you can get in terms of significant that these MMA fighters had the genetic disposition for the warrior gene. And essentially, what does that say? When we're looking at something like dopamine and that dopa dopaminergic response to stress, we're better at processing, we're better with stimuli, we're better with even like pain thresholds and things like that. So it's a crazy disposition when I think about that because my response as opposed to their response is extremely different where that stimuli and that stress is probably extremely overwhelming for me where somebody disposition to potentially be a fighter mm -hmm. is better. They thrive in that situation. So I think that's a, it's a cool aspect to look at when we look at fighting really in general. I think it's fascinating. Dopamine in general has been a topic that I've been fascinated with even more over the past uh, little while. I read the um, Lieberman book. I don't know if you read that Lieberman I book. Have it. um, it's pretty much dopamine and it, and it talks about the, enticing effects of dopamine and the idea that dopamine is what gets you out of your chair to go and accomplish things. And then when you're there accomplishing them, you switch over to your here and now neurotransmitters, serotonin, right. the things that make you feel good. And it's amazing how that, that, that dopamine neurotranslator uh, transmitter access really is the access that forces us to do anything. Right. Right. And, and you said something interesting because with that COMT gene, um, I guess the fighters, they would process the dopamine faster, if I'm not mistaken. So they have lower um, resting levels of dopamine, right. which would benefit people for fast, you know, decisions, let's do it, let's go, let's fight, let's whatever. That's and excellent. however, as beneficial as that is from an evolutionary standpoint, correct me if I'm wrong, there's the other side, which humans also needed, which would be that slow analytical person who, who takes time. And that person, if I, if I remember, they process the dopamine slower, so they have more resting levels, correct? Right, exactly right. Okay. And I, and I think that's interesting, too. You know, you look at that in terms of just like, uh, let's look at it from, you know, and this, keep this kind of a, a fighting conversation. But, mm -hmm. you know, there's a, uh, there's a documentary out there. It's the Muhammad Ali documentary where he is, where it's the, I think it's the ESPN 30 for 30 or E60 or whatever it is. And it's Muhammad versus Larry. It's Muhammad Ali, Larry Holmes, right? Yeah. And uh, it, it's, it's interesting when you think about dopamine, you think about Parkinson's disease in general and the effects, because when you're watching this, I was, I was fortunate enough during my PhD, I spent three years in a Parkinson's disease lab. So mm -hmm. really looking at the lack thereof of dopamine regulation and, and those kind of things. And when you watch that documentary, I mean, you, if you know the story, Muhammad Ali essentially went to Mayo Clinic. He went to another hospital. He was not cleared to fight. Of course, they find a doctor in, in Las Vegas, close to the casinos that 
clear him and say he has no neurological disorders. He's okay. There's always one. Right? He, also, he also did a few marriages uh, shortly thereafter. Exactly right. And I think it's interesting when you watch that actual, when you watch that, because like we were talking about in terms of the resting levels and, and, the, and basically the impairment that you have with something like Parkinson's disease, things that are lower intensity, repetitive, slower, things like jogging, things like jump rope, things like just a speed bag for somebody like him. If you watch that documentary, he can't do it. Mm. He can't do any of those things. But then when you put him in the ring and you put him in sort of a sparring, very complex, high alert situation, he still shows some glimpses of the old Muhammad Ali where he can really throw, you know, he can throw one, two, three, and he looks very dynamic and like his old self. But the very simple, slow, progressive things, he can't do. He can't even hit a speed bag. I mean, he's up there like, and yeah. it's like, it won't go. It's intentful. Like, you can see it wants to go, yeah, but it doesn't, it doesn't go. It reminds me of watching an old fighter. Like, uh, if you remember, like, Chuck Liddell? Yeah. The time where Chuck Liddell, if there was an opening, that motherfucker would throw his, his bones into your face and you'd be and dead. Dying, right. And then at the end, it's just like, there's like a... It's like you're watching them fight. You're like, go, like, go, go. And it just, it just, it just doesn't go. It's, like, it's not the same thing, but it's very similar. It's not there anymore, you know? And, that, and that's so many different aspects. It's like I've had a lot of fun now here recently with, with the university. I found a great group of fellow researchers, sort of a sports nutrition guru, a neuroscientist guru, and then myself, it's sort of the middle ground of the exercise performance and stuff like that. And we've, we've created a really cool relationship. Um, and, and if this is something that interests people, um, it's really an academic nonprofit society for neurosports. For kind neurosport, of yeah, crew. Yeah. And yeah. it was really just that conversation of, you know, there's so many different practitioners out there focusing on neurological issues. There's so many practitioners focusing on performance, sports, psychology but you never really find a place for all of these things to go together. You know, you have a conference for psychology, you have a conference for exercise science, you have a conference for this. And so it was really this idea where I've been able to, to spend a lot of time with these experts in fields like neurological disorders, like psychology, things that are out of my scope and really be able to start learning about a lot of these things and, you know, the hesitations that you're talking about, you know, what's the psychological component behind why these athletes aren't firing? What's the, physiological component behind why these athletes aren't firing you know where's it occurring in the higher orders of the brain where's it occur where's the disconnect working its way down to the body and you know again i think with somebody like with something like fighting by far the most under-researched population in the world i mean it's it's very rare that you're going to go out and find a lot of peer-reviewed publications so i think a lot of it right now is just theory but I'm having so much fun with it and, and really trying to get a better grasp and understanding for the sport just in general. Yeah, I mean, theory, theory precedes research. And I've said this a billion times because mm -hmm. as many times as, as, you know, you have a thinker like yourself who wants to try to amalgamate ideas to try to come up with, because you have a job. This mm -hmm. is the difference between people clicking on Twitter and people who have to, you know, the results need to be there. Right. And not only do results need to be there in your job, but results need to be there in a way that is monitored by mathematical numbers, right? right? So it's either, it's, it's either it's, it's there or it's not there, right? And when you have that kind of pressure, you have to take what is available in the research and you have to try to put it together to, to just decide what to do next. And I don't think people appreciate that much. Like as much as, you know, someone comes up to me and they, they have a, you know, a rib that's, you know, sprained or out, Mm -hmm. And we say like, there's a lot of research for me to manipulate a low back. There's mm -hmm. not a lot of for me to manipulate that rib joint, but right. this guy needs help. Yeah. So what do I say? And in your case, I mean, for psychology, it's so fascinating. And I'm glad we brought this up because people think of that as psychological disorder. Like if you're a fighter, how many times have you heard, oh, that guy's crazy, mm -hmm. right? That guy, that guy is just an, or you heard the word adrenaline junkie. Right. As if an adrenaline junkie is a conscious decision. Right. Where what we're saying is that, I mean, if you look at psychology and you break it down to its deepest level, we are talking about chemical soup. Right. We are talking about the, the, the control of your chemical soup. And I mean, the idea that somebody has this COMT phenotype variant that makes them more aggressive or makes them, you know, dopamine, uh, they metabolize it faster. 
but then we would call them an adrenaline junk junkie. And what we just said is that when someone uses their dopamine to accomplish something, they automatically change over into the here and now neurotransmitters of happiness, right. serotonin, cannabinoids, adrenaline, mm -hmm. et, cetera, et cetera. And now you also have to look at, so why are those people so addicted to this chemical soup? Is right. that because of this phenotype, right? And then, and then it's like, is this psychology? What are we talking about? Never mind. And then we'll get to it after. I don't want to get to a head, but how much of that misinterpretation of chemical soup is, is also enhanced by, uh, you know, long-term traumatic brain injuries, right? Right. Which I, I, I also want to get to as well. Um, but what I find amazing about this conversation is it brings us into another topic that I know that you speak about as well, which is this dark triad. Yeah. Right. And the dark triad for those, and I'm not, an, you would know this much more than me, but you can correct me. So the dark triad is this idea that there's three qualities or personality traits that come with this dark triad. And if you score high on those traits, you have the triad. Right. And that being narcissism, uh, Machiavellianism, mm -hmm. and psychopathy. Yep. Okay. And I mean, that has been studied um, in, in normal populations, looking at people with less compassion, looking at people with higher propensities to crime, but what does that look like in a fighter? Yeah, you know, and it's been a really interesting thing. And again, I will say this too. I, again, I'm just grazing the surface of mm -hmm. most knowledges in this area. I'm fortunate to work with a lot of great researchers and psychologists that, you know, they know this inside and out. Sure. Um, you know, we spent, we did a survey-based study on psychological profile, and I think we had 30 professional mixed martial artists, and I think we had about 25 controls. So we had a decent population. And, and again, it, it's one of those things when you're researching a population like this, access to UFC fighters as research subjects, you're not going to find 500. It's just, let's just get that out there, right? I got to pause you. I got to pause you because people have to know this because people yeah. listening, you're a PhD researcher. So mm -hmm. there's a reality of research that other people don't they don't know, right? A lot of people coming to me and they're like, I want to, when I was uh, a supervising clinician, they're like, is there any studies on web footed basketball players who are left handed? I'm like, what the fuck do you think happens in life? Look right. at this coronavirus and how this is managed. You think somebody gives a shit about putting money towards web footed basketball players who are like, it's right. not there. So what, 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 what Corey's saying is that a 30 person MMA group for a study is, is, huge right and, and we are talking i mean we're talking high level guys that's the that's the beauty of it because I, I think there is a lot of there is a definitely a distinct difference between that highest level and what you can be considered professional you know what i mean in, in a sport like fighting with the with just the way the regulations are but so looking at the dark triad with like the scub the subscales and stuff like that like the psychopathy you know there was actually a moderate negative correlation with psychopathy and the actual MMA fighters in terms of score and winning percentage. So I thought that was really actually very interesting, those who scored a little bit lower. Um, same thing with, the, with looking at the Machiavellianism and the narcissism, it was actually the opposite way where the higher the score, probably a little stronger relationship to winning percentage. So we found that kind of that narcissism and that Machiavellianism, those two traits of the actual triad are probably a little bit more beneficial to have for these fighting sports in terms of winning percentage where the psychopathy, you know, not quite as, you know, it's an inverse relationship. So something you don't want to be at. Now, what I thought was interesting though, when you looked at this dark triad in terms of total score, like we talked about higher the score, where you're at in this thing, there was actually no difference between significantly between our mixed martial artists and our actual college controls. So I thought that was a really interesting aspect because it, again, it went against my hypothesis. So again, we're talking about these things, you know, and, and kind of just reverting back to the conversation that we had, you know, about this idea of, you know, the dopamine response and then this, that everything associated with bliss and happiness and all this stuff. So you know, is this fighting state, this stressful state of being under pressure and fighting, really just a euphoric happiness state that you know, these, these negative aspects that we coincide with fighters, it's never really in that terms of in that interpretation. We, we, did, a, we did another study with 
comparing MMA guys and NFL athletes. And we actually used a, a neurobehavioral test in an NIH toolbox where we looked at basically some biomarkers associated with cognition and emotion. And we actually looked at anger in terms of anger and cognition. And so like with our NFL guys, thinking about the conditioning that they've been under for their entire life in terms of the coaching and those kind of things, they actually displayed and exhibited, I mean, off the chart in terms of anger being a very emotional disposition of their behavioral aspect, where fighters didn't actually show that. Um, you know, they were actually less than the professional athlete controls that we compared them to, um, where I think it was interesting with the fighters, they had some inhibition control and a little bit of processing speed issues. And again, is that the nature of the sport? You know, yeah, it, it like, is that of, there when they decided to be a fighter? Yeah, it kind of goes with that CTE talk. Um, so it's all really interesting. We even did some stuff, trade anxiety, state anxiety. And I'm talking a lot about the psych, but it's so new to me, like something I've never yeah. really focused on in terms of sports psych that Love it. I'm obsessed with it right now. Um, Essentially, when you perform, there's two different types of anxiety. There's state anxiety, and this is basically the uncontrollable portion that we've talked about, the genetic component of how we handle physiological stress and, and those kind of things. Um, in, terms of, in terms of trait anxiety, we're talking about self-perception, fear of failure, ego, all of those different things. And, and again, I think as, ex, as expected, in terms of mixed martial artists compared to college age controls, they had much, much lower trade anxiety displayed on a daily basis. Um, you know, they, they just don't have it. They're not afraid to fail. They're humble. They fight exposed in front of 15,000 people. So, you know, with that, I would expect that. Um, the last thing we did off that study, that dark triad, the, trade anxiety, we did something called an, a basically a difficulty in emotional regulation scale. It's a DERS 18 and it's looking at a lot of different aspects of emotional regulation. Now, I thought it was interesting because again, we hypothesized that a lot of this emotional regulation and their control would have been higher. And again, we were completely wrong that they actually showed a lot less in terms of like strategic preparation and resilient or strategic preparation and uh, control and, and different things like that, which I think at first I was very surprised, but then I had to really think about why and what, what this is. And in my mind, it sort of twisted into this idea that maybe they're more resilient, maybe their ability to have less strategy, to have less control over those things and maybe be a little bit more reactive is probably a benefit to fighting. Then I go back and I step back and I think about what am I doing with every fighter on a camp to camp basis? I'm sitting down and I'm saying, this is the way we're gonna lay out your schedule. This practice is gonna couple with this practice. This is where practice is with our recovery session. This is your strength. And then I think about it and I say, what are we really doing with these fighters? We're really sitting here saying, show up at this time with this equipment and we're gonna tell you exactly what to do. When we sit down and watch film, you know, when the, you know, the skill coaches sit down and watch film, what are they doing with these fighters? They're telling them, this is the game plan. This is what we're going to follow. This is your strength. This is how you're going to do it. So you really think about it. A lot of those things, they've kind of pushed those responsibilities to the people that they're paying on, a, you know, a camp to camp basis as their team, putting in instilling a lot of trust where they can come in and just do what they do best. And that's perform and react and, and that kind of thing. So it, it's really cool to me. I know I'm, a lot of things coming out, but you know, that was a cool study that I thought was just a lot of insight on these guys. And with, and with regards to nature versus nurture with all of these things that I don't know that, is there any, any concept at all of, I, I mean, again, I don't know. It's yeah. my mind. I think, I think our environment, I think the environment they're exposed to has an enhanced and exacerbated a lot of these qualities again i think that idea of you know being just a conversation all right so i'm going to look at somebody like kamara usman you know world champion welterweight world champion right and, and i think there's a lot to look at in, in regards to 
really, really two conversations, but I'll start with where my train of thought was, you know, Kamaru is a guy that has wrestled his entire life, has competed at the highest level, was an Olympic alternate, those kind of things. And he comes into this world of mixed martial arts and is a very dominant fighter right off the get-go. You know, his wrestling helps him. He lost, I want to say, his third or fourth fight, a small show down in South Florida. And this is before I ever worked with him. This was a rear naked choke. A, you know, he allowed his wrestling to be effective didn't really have the Brazilian jiu-jitsu background and lost to a rear naked choke. Mm -hmm. and now I look at the steps that he's taken since. I mean, he's a, he's a high level BJJ black belt. People don't know that about him. Nobody knows that about him. Yeah. At that time, he was a white belt. He barely even put on a gi. From that moment on, I mean, you know, you look at the idea of what his environment, you know, what his experiences and what his environment have led to, you know, a lot of this training and the changes in his training and the, the stresses of going in as a white belt and a blue belt and putting himself in the fire with these high level purple belts and black belts, you know, cause he's not a guy that's going to go into a room and compete with guys that are white and blue belt. He's not going to do it. He's a guy that's going to, no matter what, he's going to find the guy with the highest belt and he's going to put himself in that situation. And, you know, over time of these humbling experiences in this environment that you're putting yourself into, you know, how much of this stuff is a, you know, is this and these psychological traits a result of that mm -hmm. or are these psychological traits already there that force you to go down this path to begin with? And again, it's the chicken and the egg. I don't know the answer. I, I don't, and I don't, I think that might've been an unfair question because I don't know anybody knows the answer to that, to be honest with you, but it is a mate, man, I, I thought I turned off this dinging fucking thing for my emails, but I, I all of a sudden got 300 emails all at the same time. And I don't know. Yeah. And I have to go and delete them all of them without reading them, which is what I usually do. Right. Now that's kind of the same thing I do. But I, th I think it's, um, what was I saying there? You were saying something about the, the, how they, they, the fighters respond. I find this the same way with my athletes. It's like, there's, um, the athletes will generally do what you tell them as long as you build some kind of trust, right? right. They'll put their trust in you. But I find with MMA athletes, they almost want to take their, their, their hands off the controls, mm -hmm. right? And they want to be guided much more so than, let's say, a hockey player that I'll work with or a basketball player that I work with, which seems like they have more independence. And I wonder if that, once again, is this concept of uh, you're, you're training, competing, and living in a perpetual fear response. Right. And I know that when I'm scared, I will look to the specialists of the field to guide me and to tell me what to do, right? And the more I, the, the less I know about a topic, the more I have to rely on those specialists. And I wonder if that is a result of the sport itself. And I think it is. And, and I'll give some, I'll give you a good example without sort of pinpointing this. There, there's been a couple of different incidences that, that I've noticed and even, you know, been a part of, unfortunately, in, in these kind of camp dynamics where I think there's certain athletes that this fear response, and especially I think after an athlete comes off of a sort of a, a hurdle in their career, maybe they were once on top and then, you know, whatever, all the pressures of that, losing these kind of things kind of coincide but you know I find that I see some athletes that were once the top echelon of the sport getting later on in their career and stuff like that and I think that fear you start to see that response a little bit more especially in some of their actions where which was once their small close-knit group of you know we're going to go in there we're going to live or die together that kind of thing where you start to see that circle grow and and not just grow at the beginning of a camp I'm talking 10 days before a fight, all of a sudden you bring in this expert nutritionist that's never worked with you, has no idea what you've done in the past because you think they can take some of the pressure away. You know, and I want to, I want to say it's probably an idea to take some of the pressure away of if you do fail, you know, I have, a, I have somebody else, you know, and I don't know if it's, I have somebody else in the circle that's failing with me as well, or if it's, now I have a shift of blame. I shouldn't have done something different. I don't know what it is, but I find that a lot of times, especially when, when athletes are getting to that point where they're not as successful as they used to be, 
they start to show those habits just a little bit more where, you know, those certain athletes that are extremely successful and at the top, I mean, if anything, if there's one thing that I can say that they show a good trade up, typically their circles shrink. even. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, you, you start, you start grasping at straws and anything that will, uh, and you know what, and athletes from my experience, if you probably say the same there, they become more vulnerable to bullshit. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately we are in a profession where there is no shortage of bullshit. Like there is, there is no shortage of someone who's going to tell the fighter, you know, you should have been doing this instead of this. Mm -hmm. and, and now, you know what I mean? And then all of a sudden you have a fighter who has had good quality training his whole life, been to some of the best camps and then gets convinced from some guru who owns a, a ranch somewhere or whatever that they have the, the magic sauce. Um, and then they, they run at that magic sauce as if it's going to help them. But yeah. Did you freeze? Never going to. Oh, there you go. Sorry. You just froze for a second. So okay. the last thing I said was magic sauce, <laughs> magic sauce, you know, and, and I think that's a warning for these athletes that they, they, they need to really be hesitant and be aware of that. I mean, again, they can get sold on the idea. And I think anybody that, you know, creates this idea that, you know, when you look at what I'm doing, I didn't create this system. You know, I took the best resources and the best best resources, the best information that I have to put this together. And I think a lot of times, you know, the special sauce is something that's unique to only this individual. And they're the only one that knows how to do this. And that was the key and weird thing. And I mean, it, let, let's just say it. It's fucking easy to go watch a fight, see where somebody got beat and say, you have the, you have the ability to fill that void or that hole, yep. especially in strength and conditioning. And yep. that's the thing. And, and I, you know, I just want to be as honest as I can about something like strength and conditioning. It's I built my entire career. I love it. I'm geared to it, but it's about 10% of that, of that puzzle at the end of the day. Right. I mean, look, at the end of the day, the best fighter is probably going to find a way to win. That's just the, the, the hard facts that fight. Now in my mind, I think our role is really to support the preparation in terms of the fighting I think our role is to enhance any sort of utilization of energy that these athletes can do to make sure they're healthy, injury-free, they have all the confidence that they have, knowing that they are able to perform, right? But at the end of the day, I say this to every single guy, like, when we close a camp, listen, you are going to go in there and you are at your best physical ability. You are at the best condition you possibly can, strongest, the most powerful, you're on weight. All of those things are the best they can be for you. Now, are you a better fucking fighter than this guy or not? Let's find out. Yep. 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 That's it's, you know what, that's, that's what a brilliant point because someone listening to this, who, you know, you're a trainer, you've spoken to a few people who have trained professionals, you know, that guy, uh, you, you once met a, a professional once and you gave him some advice, um, but you haven't been in the trenches with them. You haven't trained with them. I was going to say, I, I, I have come to the same conclusion that you have, have come to, it seems, with working with pros, right? So if I'm at the UFC PI or if I'm at, you know, what, what are the NFL camp? I think our job is to make Kamaro Usman get out of his own way. Right. Such that if I can make... Kamaro Usman's body do what Kamaro Usman's brain wants him to do, mm -hmm. well, then you're dealing with possibly the best fighter on the planet. That's and true. I think a lot of strength and conditioning, instead of the concept of enhancing, mm -hmm. uh, people are missing the boat because it, Kamaro, listen, man, you're an amazing trainer. You're a PhD. You have all this, but Kamaro Usman's Kamaro Usman because of Kamaro Usman, right? 30 years of wrestling are the yeah. reason that he can go out there and dominate for 25 minutes without breathing one gasp of heavy air. That's why. And I, I always tell people, I'm like, if, if you got LeBron James in your clinic today, mm -hmm. like, you know what I mean? Like, what are you, what are you going to do? Like, well, I'm going to do different plyos. You think he hasn't done fucking plyos? Like, I'm going to make him his, I'm going to increase his Olympic lifting. Right. Do you think that's what's going to make, did, did Kamara Usman ever say when he lost to rear naked choke, did he ever say, you know, man, if I just had 25 more pounds on my squat, I, I would have, it, it's, 
it's amazing. And the idea that a trainer, you know, you, you say do these things and then the person does something impressive and then the trainer goes, that's me. That's my system. That's yep. the, the Stevenson strength system. It's but, fucking horseshit, man. It's it, they're also they're also the first ones that when that loss comes by, yeah, they're gonna they're gonna hide, you know. Uh, you, there was too many. Uh, you know, you didn't drink enough water, right? Yep. The, the, you know, it, it, all this nonsense. And poor athletes, man. They're so susceptible to it. And the idea that society looks at athletes and goes, "I should be doing what they do because that's what made them great." Like, right. no, man, no. No, the biggest guy in the gym is not the smartest trainer, right? The, the fastest guy in the gym didn't get that way because he had some special magic. You know, there's only, you said it yourself, there's only a certain pool of knowledge accumulated in, in the history of humanity that we have to pull from. And I say the same thing. People will accuse me of, you're, you're in, you think you're inventing something. Mm -hmm. I have not invented a goddamn thing. I think it's insulting to the accumulative knowledge of humanity to assume that you invented something. Right. You know, like, I'm only here for this small blip in the evolutionary process, like almost for a millisecond. And the idea that I figured it out is, is horseshit. Right. So right. that's why when people are going to seminars and stuff like that, I always say, when you go to the seminar, if they're massaging the same information in a different way so that you can think about it differently, that's great. Mm -hmm. But if you come out saying, wow, I didn't, I never thought of any of that. And that guy was saying things that I've never heard of. That guy's full of shit. <laughs> yep. You're a PhD in exercise physiology, man. Right. You know the limitations of research. You know what the research is. And people come to conclusions that are, are so crazy. And again, I, I'm glad I'm speaking to a highly educated person because when I'm having like one of those stupid, shitty Twitter banters back and forth, right? and I don't want to be that guy, but I'll, I'll go to the person and I'll see what's their background. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm not the smartest guy in the world. If anything, I try harder because I'm an idiot. Right. But I remember being in the anatomy cadaver lab at like 8.30 at night on a Friday while other people were drinking and looking at the layers of anatomy and trying to figure it out and reading textbooks and blah, blah. And then I have a person who has like a weekend, you know, yoga course. Mm -hmm. And they're telling me, well, you never thought of this. Or what about the glutes and the inhibition of the glutes? Right. Like, Holy shit, man. It's, we don't, we're not even on the same, you know what I mean? It's like if you were speaking to an infectious disease expert, right. you're, not, you're, you're not allowed to pretend to be on the same level. Right. And then I think that's the thing too. I think it's easy to identify now. That that's the that's the worst part about it. You 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 catch your tells right away. You jargon, I think jargon's the easiest way. When somebody sounds like they're reading off of a page on Wikipedia, yeah. but it's starting to come into their personal life, like you know what's going on here. You understand the jargon. Like it's easy to regurgitate things that aren't your own idea. Where in my mind, I'd rather listen to somebody else's idea and be able to apply it to the people I'm working with. That's part of being good at what I am, being able to take the, take the information that you provided during FRC and be able to figure out how to apply it to my athletes best. That's what makes you good at what you do. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's the thing. And, and it's just, it, this field's so saturated with it now. It's, it is unfortunate. There are specialists, you would agree. That's the other thing. I, right now in society, and I don't want to get political, but there's, it seems to me like the, one of the major problems is this loss of the idea that specialists exist. Mm -hmm. And in my mind, if, if you don't, if, if let's say that you're someone who doesn't feel that if another human being puts all of their time and attention into a topic, that that person might have more information about the topic than you, mm -hmm. then society as a whole doesn't work anymore. Right. You know what I mean? Like, how many times have you seen someone complaining about, like, you know, big pharma or medical technology, and they're complaining while they're on a fucking phone? Right. Yeah. Like, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, shut the fuck up. What do you do for a living, sir? Like, and I always say this to, to other people. Right now, there is a big health crisis, and we are in the health profession. Mm -hmm. And I see patients, so I'm intimately involved with this, with understanding this process. And I always tell someone, I was like, okay, so you're telling me this is how we should deal with this crisis. This is, we shouldn't, we don't need that. We don't need this. We don't need that. And I say, okay, so what do you do for a living? Mm -hmm. And you say, I'm an architect. Imagine if I just said, you know what? I saw your architectural plans and I think you fucked up. Yeah, this building, I don't believe in it. 
Like, like I, I just, I don't know. I, something about the information that I have makes it that your drawing is wrong. Everyone look at me like I have two fucking heads, right? But in this scenario, everyone has an opinion about the ongoing health and wellness of human beings across the board where most people can't tell me, you know, more than one organ system in the body or the, the function of metabolism of dopamine in the brain. And what is dopamine? Where is it? What's a basal ganglia for fuck's sake? What is the pre, what is the premotor cortex? Right. Just answer me this question. And then if you don't know that it's the only reason we're having this conversation, then we don't deserve to be in this conversation anymore. Exactly right. No, yeah. and, I, and I love it. it. It is true. There are people that they're, it, I don't even, I, I could, I could go on for days on this topic too. I mean, mm -hmm. that's, that's the funny thing about it. It's just, and, and why is it that it's, is it, why is it that health and wellness? Is it because people can physically appear as if they have the knowledge? I mean, what makes this feel different? That's what I don't understand. And I think that's really it. I think it's just the, the shallowness of, of the field itself, that if somebody has a six pack, then they know exactly what to do. You think maybe it's because the field is somehow owned by every homo sapien that's born? Like, for example, like, I don't know anything about, you know, the stresses that affect metal. Like, I'm, I'm not an engineer, right? I don't know about, you know, the construction of a bridge. But I don't need to know about that because it's not part of my life. I can get by without bridges. Right. But what you can't get by with is... is is ownership of your own health. And maybe that's why, maybe yeah. it's because you're forced to be an expert in a topic that nobody talked to you about. I always say that. I mean, humans are not given enough information on what it is to be human, to be able to make smart decisions about the maintenance of that human. Yeah, for sure. I mean, so, definitely. Yeah. Maybe it's that, maybe it's like you said, genetic variants where I go into a gym or you go into a gym with all this knowledge, and then Kamaro goes into the gym and you're both working out and he just makes you look like a, a child. And then it's like, okay, Kamaro. But then Kamaro looks at you. And this is what people get confused about, I think. Yeah. But, you know, getting back to your question, let's make this so that people actually who do need help, what is a useful, if you had to say, what is something that young MMA or combat athletes are not doing that they should be doing more of? Is there any, what, what are the suggestions for young fighters or? So you know? I think in my mind with these, with these youngest fighters, I think a lot of them have been or are being influenced now by some of the, some of the management, some of the older fighters and things like this, where I don't think they're exposing themselves to as much training and variance and competition mm. as the athletes that are there now, right? I think some of these fighters are, you know, it, it's, it's unfortunate, especially in boxing. I mean, boxing, I'll say, is way worse than anything else. But even in MMA now, you're starting to see it, man. Like, you have these fighters now that are 10-0, and 11-0, and 0, and you go look at their opponent's combined records, and you're seeing something like 3-27. and 27. It's like – Man, are you really in an 11 and 0 fighter? And that's great because guess what? That just got you to UFC, Bellator, or whatever the case was, because somebody didn't really look at your, they just saw 11 and 0, three knockouts. They didn't look at the fact that you just fought, you know, a guy that's a yeah. full time lawn and landscaper that fights for beer money on the side. You know, you didn't look at, you didn't look at all these things. <laughs> and so what I think they do is they do everything they can in their power to sort of avoid losing avoid tough competition to get there and when they get there they can't make a career out of it they can't stay there and i think that's a really really underlooked aspect of all of this you know and boxing's really bad at this where you talk about you talk about padding the the record padding the record and, and things like that i think you're seeing that a lot where you're seeing them picking and choosing opponents and this is new to me where i'll be honest this is something that five years ago like when i first got into it with the black zillions and those guys were just fighting anybody anywhere and again i don't think it's necessarily such a bad thing in our gym where i look at somebody our head coach is henry hooft he's a dutch kickboxer genius. yeah genius and that's the thing too he's a really smart guy he comes off you know everything that the way he plays himself and presents himself it's 
you know, simplicity, this and that. And there's brilliance in that idea of simplicity that he puts behind it. Always is, right? Always is. Yeah. And, um, you know, he's a guy that he's not like that, man. He's, he's old school in that aspect that fight anytime, fight anybody, fight anywhere. And I think it's, it's really a good culture that we've created in our gym because even for me as a strength and conditioning coach, you know, I've had to, I've had to really find this, this balance between what you want to call quote unquote out of camp and in camp, because I don't think we really have the luxury with 90% of our fighters to designate where they're at. I think so many times these guys are being presented with an opportunity on two weeks, three weeks notice that they just can't say no to because you just the politics in this sport and promotions and promoters and stuff, those opportunities might not come back for a year or two years, three years. And you don't know what could happen in that short period of time. So I think it's a, uh, not so much, you know, that's definitely not in our gym, but I'm seeing that quite a bit across the sport now where these guys used to fight anybody anywhere. And now people are trying to make it to the big show rather than to build a sustained career. Like I look at somebody like Nick Lentz. He's a guy I've worked with. He's at Stanford, right? Yeah. Five yeah. or six fights. Yeah. Dude, this guy's had 23 UFC fights or more or less something around that. Yep. He's fought his ass off in every fight. Yep. Win some, lose some, but guess what? He wasn't doing that. He wasn't ducking anybody, dude. He was he was learning lessons from those hard fights coming up, and and then he gets there and he's ready to be there for a career. Oh yeah, and, Lens. How long has he been in the, in the, in the I game? Don't, oh, I don't. I don't even know, man. I mean, he's just such a. You know, he was somebody that I think he came over. I want to say maybe three years ago, something like that. I think. I think I've had him for about five or five or six fights now. And um, he's just awesome. I mean, he's just an awesome guy. He's just a, a wealth of knowledge and, and one of those teammates that he's uh, – and what I, you know what else I really like about somebody like him? He's not a guy that's just very open. And, I mean, he, it takes time to earn his trust mm -hmm. and the trust of the people around him. But then once you have it, he's the best teammate, one of the best – you know, he's just – He's just an all-around really, really good guy, man, and good mm -hmm. fighter. And, and somebody these young guys need to aspire to be like. But you see that in his personality. Like, you know, I took my wins. I took my losses. But I, I gained something from those experiences and, and brought it here. Mm -hmm. You know, you even see it sometimes in the training. I, I always say this. Like, these young guys that I know are going to be most successful, you know, it, it's, it's one of those things. I have so many guys in this, in this gym that sometimes I feel like the – just the – your UFC guys are going to always get the most attention and, you know, your Bellator, your 1FC champs and stuff like that are going to get the most attention. And then you've got to kind of figure out how much time you can dedicate to these younger guys and still give those guys their the adequate attention they need. But I'll tell you, you latch on to some of those young guys right away when you see kind of one thing, and this is what I always see. This is my observation. When those older guys, those guys that have made it, your Michael Chandler's, your Robbie Lawler's, your Kamara Usman's, start using you a lot as a body for their training, like their camp training and their preparation and their live rolling and stuff like that. And you don't shy away from that. You're not hiding from that. You go in, you're giving them the ability to give them a good look, a safe look, taking your lumps in the process, but knowing how much you're absorbing out of that experience. Those are the guys I latch on to because those are the guys that I know are going to be really successful. Those, if those top of the line guys see merit in you that they think they can actually use you as a body for their camp mm. and you know there's something special in those guys and and there are guys on those mats that have that capability but they shy away from that they hide from that you know let's just be honest Kamara's going to beat the shit out of me today but I'm willing to go in there and learn from that experience where some guys are going to shy away from that a little bit you see it in like in you know uh, amateur BJJ places all over the place man everywhere you go there's the guy who's choose picking his roles there's the guy who's uh turning on the gas when the instructor is beside them uh there's the guy who has different intensity in practice versus grading yep right and then there's and then there's the opposite guy the guy who couldn't, who couldn't give a shit right? the guy who understands that a black belt is someone who got tapped out way more than you did <laughs> right? right talking about the bjj world there's a great example and, and you know it's uh, and a guy i got i was fortunate enough i worked with him 
during the Black Zillion. So I spent a couple camps with him. And, you know, now we set up for a title shot against Kamaru and still a part of Sanford, Gilbert Burns. Well, Gil, I, you notice I yeah. noticed that, and I want to, I'm not going to interrupt you, but uh, we were talking a lot about the Black Zillion, but now you're at Sanford MMA, which I want to ask you specifically about. But continue that with Gilbert, because that was interesting, because they're on the same team. Same team, right. Same so team. you look at somebody like Gilbert, man, and when you talk about that shine away from competition and you see that BJJ mentality where you know the guys that are going to take those roles, man, Gilbert's one of those guys. Look at what he's done in this crazy career of his where he'll yeah. go out and fight top 10 UFC guy, and a week later somebody falls out of a high-level BJJ competition, and, hey, I'm ready. Right I'll come roll. I'll come do it. It's just – it's part of the life that he's lived, and honestly, it's the reason why he's sitting there fighting for a world title right now with – you presented with this opportunity to, you know, again, I don't know if they, they have to, you know, sign that, but that was, that was the, it was sign. signed. Yeah. yeah. That was signed. He got and, COVID, right? He had COVID positive, yeah. right? Did he have symptoms? Or is he okay now? He had, he had a little bit of symptoms. Yeah. Okay. He actually did. And, uh, you know, he, I think it was, and uh, this is something too, that you're seeing a lot and this, not just our gym, but talking to some of the people in the area and the field, you know, a lot of these symptoms, are presenting themselves similar to just signs of regular overtraining and wearing. Training. Training. I think these guys sometimes it's kind of like, all right, I feel tired. I know something's a little off, but maybe I'll just take a day or two to recover. And then they realize, okay, something's not right. And that's, mm -hmm. you know, but it's, it's tough with a sport like that. Cause a lot of the overtraining stuff is similar, but, but Gilbert's one of those guys, man. He's a, he's a guy that will not shy away from anybody. Even, I mean, I think he was sitting ready as the number one contender and I think a short notice fight against like number 13 popped up and he was on Twitter saying I'll take that fight like you're about to give up potentially losing a title fight to go fight this guy just because it's yeah. a real fight you're ready to fight like he's one of those guys where I think his management's had to like tell him like okay just slow down we know you want to fight we know you're going to put your name in the hat but now we have to be strategic and a good another good point when you have a, a, a specialist like yourself uh, to talk to it, you, you should bring this up it's you said that there's no off season now right. and and now especially now where there's like you know we don't where is there a fight am i going to be brought to fight island am i going to is bellator coming like who knows everyone's ready at all times and that presents a problem for people in our profession right because we're in the force accounting mm -hmm. you know the the force accounting business where we have to think about how many forces are is this person absorbing and taking and what is the the result on their body so i would argue and you're going to correct me if i'm wrong that in in your field specifically in your sport uh, i guess it's common for a lot of sports but it's it's not about what's the next drill what's the coolest thing to give more of it's what to take away absolutely and i've noticed with my athletes i you know with regards to strength training i have in the last few years have been just tirelessly trying to, you know, figure this out. Like you do with the psychology, I'm stuck in this loop. Mm -hmm. And I think that, um, like you alluded to that strength and conditioning, I actually, I shouldn't say that weight training, because there's a big difference between strength training and weight lifting, right. but there is a crazy overemphasis on the movement of external weights. Mm -hmm. And what I found with my athletes is the more I'm drawing back, right. And the more I'm picking and choosing what's an important load, what's not an important load, mm -hmm. the, 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 the better I'm getting in terms of results, in terms of performance, in terms of longevity, in terms of psychological drive. Mm -hmm. uh, because, I mean, I, again, I saw someone the other day, a golfer, and it was tweeted that the, this professional golfer was squatting or split squatting like 500 pounds or something. Right. Like, that's awesome. What the fuck are you doing? Like, right. what in the hell do you think you're benefiting by, by split squatting 500 pounds? Do you know the spinal load on your, do you know the penalty on the spine of right. doing something like that? And I'm saying, what, there's a billion ways to load a golfer such that the loading will change their body to output more force or to absorb more force. And doing a 500 pound split squat is not that exercise. No, you're, you're exactly right. I think that that's kind of it, man. It's, it's understand because what you have to understand too, when, when, when you're in this conversation, you know, tell me this, what does that 500 pound split squat do to his next two to three days of 
golf specific training, right? I mean, there's a risk and reward for this. Your, your strength and conditioning has to be a complement to your training. Mm-hmm. I mean, if I destroy somebody and they look like shit at sparring, do you know the repercussions and the conversation Henry's going to have with me? I mean, yeah. I'm aware of what this, I'm aware of how this conversation, I've had it before, especially I'm, I'm guilty in my early days. I came from a football background. I'm guilty. I was, mm-hmm. I was that guy. I, I learned and I, and I had to, but my volumes were too high. My intensities were too high. It was just, it was just nature of me coming from what I knew and thinking that I could apply some of that into the sport. I, I learned, I, thankfully I had great resources, a guy like Jake Bonacci, uh, Tony Ricci, Chris Eldridge. I just have a lot of guys around me that helped me better understand this and, and I'm fortunate of that, but like, you know, even just when I look at what I do, right? I think there are, there are focal lifts and focal requisites of strength that we have to have in certain movement patterns. I think they're, they're ideal for certain performance. Where I look at somebody like Kamaro, and I think when you look at the way he fights, I think he's a very hip hinged dominant guy, very minimal bend and flexion in the actual knees itself. So a lot of our focus is going to be built around his, his strength in that hip hinge position through that hip hinge, whether it be an RDL, deadlift, whatever yeah, it yeah. might be, right? And so really taking that ability and just contrasting that with some form of movement where he lacks, I think is really important. So I think, you know, I think people hear this all the time and I think people hear of contrast training, right? And I think that's something that's kind of came up and it's that idea of really looking at like post-activation potentiation and being able to couple those properly with intensities. I think a lot of the the stuff that you're going to read out there online is a little bit wrong where I don't think you need to be working in the 95% of your strength work, especially with one of these fights, I think you're going to get in some trouble. But I think if we can hover that 80 to 85% range for a good quality two to five reps in terms of our strength work, mm-hmm. I think if we couple that with a contrast movement that is adequate for their, for their weaknesses or deficiencies, that's another thing where I think when you look at this post-activation potentiation idea of contrast training, and essentially, if people are listening and they don't know what the hell I'm talking about, some do, you're essentially taking, let's just say, something that you've seen a million times, a squat with a box jump, right? We take something that's a heavy loaded, you know, exercise, and we couple it with a non-loaded power type exercise. And, and we use a lot of those for the idea that I think I can, get, I can get more for less. I don't need to load them up, like you said, with 500 pounds in a split squat. What can I do? I can take something like a deadlift and I can work them at about 80 to 85% for fast, safe, stable, strong movements yep. that I know aren't going to hinder their performance later, but are still going to get the activation, the fire, and the strength. And then I can couple those with a contrast type movement. I think this is where people lose the concept of this idea, where they've seen something like a squat and a box jump. But why do you choose a box jump? And that's the question. You know, I think people don't realize there's two aspects of this. There's a rate of force development aspect where an, athlete, okay. where an athlete's deficient at their force development and rate. But that's not always the case. Sometimes when you look at it, it's really just the elasticity component or basically the, the plyometric component, energy storage component that they're deficient at. Two very different things. So when you're looking at what that contrast might be, you need to identify is that rate of force development where this athlete's deficient and we need to enhance, or is it the elasticity component? And again, easy way to do that. Let's just do a, let's do a dead, a non-counter movement vert, a counter movement vert, and then let's do some form of depth jump that that involves lowering the center of mass and, and sort of gaining that, you know, external force and being able to absorb that. And I think that's where people sort of mess up with this, where they're not getting the most efficient use of this contrast for their athlete. So like when I know somebody like Kamaru, for instance, his elasticity is super high. His rate of force development is where he, and again, doesn't lack compared to most people. He's still in the top 99 percentile, but that's compared to the hundred percentile. So that's sort of the, the missing link that we are trying to enhance. So if we're looking at something like rate of force development and we're looking at a deadlift, we're going to do something from a standstill position where he's in a dead position, maybe like in a, a banded RDL where we're at a complete dead movement and it's a pop through. Now, let's say on the contrary, if it was something where he's, where he's missing the elasticity component, that's where we would do something like a kettlebell swing that involves that elastic component, that energy storage, that, you know, really those three aspects of 
eccentric amortization concentric of the of the plyometric chain so i think being able to identify where those weaknesses are in the athlete can really take away from what you said the the fear and the thought of having to build that strength with a loaded single leg squat if we can couple those movements together in the right way we're probably going to get more and again i think a lot of this is sort of I think some of this has been supported in research literature. I think some of it has been theorized, but again, I think it goes hand in hand. What are we doing in a combination like this? You know, we're looking at an increase in synap synaptic excitation. We're probably looking at more motor activation. We're probably looking at things on the myelin sheath that in terms of adaptation, in terms of what we would see with just basic strength training and increased muscle, we'd have to be seeing on this neurological, mm -hmm. this neurological component and aspect. So, I think it's just, you know, a little long winded there, but again, it kills me when I see what you said, seeing somebody load up at 500 pounds, doing a single leg for this, that, and the other, how does that apply? And how does that carry over to your sport? That is a highly powerful rotational sport, high velocity. Like it just doesn't have the carryover and you're going to fuck up your training for the next two or three days. And, and I, and I can hear people online going crazy because people always assume that you never thought about what they thought about, but I, it's not like we're not saying being strong at a, a golfer should be strong. Right. Like there's, there's no other outcome measure that I know of that really makes a goddamn difference other than the execution of strength, right. either to create motion or to absorb uh, and and prevent motion, right? And and you brought up a really good point, which some people might have picked up on. But what you were taught, you you said a lot about rate of force development, which brings up a concept that speed is strength, and strength is speed. Right. And and speed is the is the thing that we're, you can't always be moving things. Well, you should never be moving heavy weights slow, as per Louis Simmons. But you have to consider that you have to you have to train on a variety of speeds it's not all about you know put the speed all the way down so the force is as high as it possibly can be and and max your deadlift like how how strong like kamaro usman mm -hmm. is it fucking strength is that his problem if you were to say he has a problem like is he not fast enough is he not strong enough like th these things are I, I love the way you said that if you're if you're in a room with henry who Henry's job is Kamaru Usman winning the title. Your job is, is, and it's not belittling your job, it's to be on the sidelines to mm -hmm. try to give Henry what he needs. Exactly right. Right? And I was, at, I was working with, a, um, we had a group of uh, MLB teams, and we did a, a seminar there, and we were talking to, there was a group of the strength and conditioning coaches, and then there was the, the I think it was the pitching coach. Mm -hmm. And I was saying, I was asking the coach, I was like, what do you want? Like, what, when, when I give you this body, what do you want? And he says, I want a body that will adapt to the inputs I put in. I want an adaptable body that's ready to listen, that is ready to take um, practice and, 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 and improve the practice with the, with the meat wagon that, that you're providing. Right. And I think that's the thing that people, because if you're a strength and conditioning coach, you have a lot of times you think that it's you who's doing it and it is, but it's, it's a fighter has to fight and they have to get good at fighting. And your job is to make them good at fighting. Your okay. job is not to make them a great Olympic lifter. Yeah. And I think you, you met, you made a really good point there in terms of, in terms of your theory behind that and, and, and that conversation with the coach, it's, it's one of those ideas that, you know, in my mind, I don't even ever call my conditioning component conditioning, right? Mm -hmm. We're enhancing the metabolic systems, the bioenergetic systems. And, and that's my idea is like, when I sit down and I talk with Henry and we look at this camp and we lay these things down, I know the exact amount of volume in terms of his rounds, in terms of how much time they're going to put a grappling body in on him, a striking body, this and that. And, and again, it takes a long time. I mean, it's with Kamaru, we've been together, I mean, since 2015. So mm -hmm. it, there's been a lot of time to, to, to learn and understand how he responds and, and those kind of things. But like, essentially, I'm not conditioning him to fight. I'm conditioning his energy systems. I'm training his energy systems most efficiently based on what the utilization is going to be on the mats. 
over the course of that week, that training block, that phase, whatever it is, you know? When are we going to enhance the glycolytic system? When are we gonna enhance the alactic system? When do those things need to be most efficiently enhanced and utilized in our strength and conditioning sessions so that there's a carryover into what his training is? So there's a carryover into those energy systems being more efficient when they're placed under stress based on the training, you know? Like I know what he's gonna do and, and that's the thing. People always want to say, you know, how do you get them in such good shape? And it's not that. I am working my ass off through proper intervals, through proper volume, through proper intensities, METs, heart rates, all of those things observed, stopwatches, all the basic metrics is to follow the most standardized and, you know, in my case, validated protocols that enhance those things to allow him to perform at the amount a volume, effort, intensity that he needs on those mats. And at the end of the day, that's where everything comes together. On fight day, that's where hopefully all of that training that he did over there shows up and shows that he is, and I think up until this point, he has shown that there's very few people in the world that, if anybody, that can compete with him from a physical level, from a wrestling level. We'll get to that. Just a piece. I, I can't even yeah. – anyway, the, the, I was going to say that I say – you know, it's nomenclature. I always say tissue specific before pattern specific. And what you just said was system specific before pattern specific. And it's the same, it's the same argument. And it's, I'm, I've never said that you shouldn't deadlift. You shouldn't lift. You shouldn't do pattern training. I, blah, blah, blah. But what I am saying is that the, the athlete is already patternized. That's what makes them an athlete. Right. Right. So I have to make sure that their tissues can absorb the training. Mm -hmm. can dissipate the forces so that they're safe while training and then that their energy systems can complement what they need to do and, and, for their training. and that's such a great way to look at it because i just it's 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 great to hear somebody and an expert in your field and your specialization speak like that because you're right their movement patterns are specific to their sport, right? And we can't compare the movement patterns of an, a mixed martial artist to the movement patterns of a golfer to the movement patterns of this and that. All we can do is look at the movement patterns that they have created to be fucking successful right. at what they do and strengthen the tissue around it and, and understand that we're creating and strengthening this disposition that we've already seen based off of this. I mean, Let's just look at it. Let, let's look at let's look at movement pattern, for instance. Let's look at a picture, right? And let's say we're doing some movement pattern test, or whatever the case might be, in those upper extremities. And you have more experience with this work with baseball, but you can't tell me that that fucking shotgun laser of a of a rifle arm has the same movement pattern as their left arm. Has the yeah. same movement pattern as me, who doesn't throw a baseball 100 miles an hour. You can't do yeah. that. We understand they're different, yeah. but let's make sure that we're providing the quality and support of that difference in movement to, to hopefully enhance and contribute to the continued 101 mile an hour fastball and, and those kind of things. And by the way, I got to point this out again for, for less experienced trainers. I mean, what, yeah, you, that movement pattern, I mean, that movement pattern is trained, right? That movement pattern is trained over and over, but you know what? to maintain that movement pattern, to make him so that he can execute the move. It's not all about making the movement pattern better. Like an ex you don't have to say a baseball pitcher does this. Let me pick an exercise, which exactly right. mimics that. It's like, right. hold on a second. I just watched your baseball team in the batting cages swing like a hundred or 200 times. Right. Max effort, by the way. Because it's not like they try to hit it slow. That guy tried to crush that ball 600 times doing the exact same movement. And he had to hit a ball coming at 90-something miles an hour at the end of a moment arm, which is extraordinarily long. So now the amount of into your body, right? One of my professors, uh, Kim Ross, he used to talk about the vibrations through the body. Like when you step down, the body's tissues go Kamara Usman, whose body is stiff in the right ways, when he steps down, it goes boom and stops. So you don't get that verberation of, 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 you know, of um, stressors through the body because he has stiff, good quality tissue. So back to these people hitting this baseball, is like, so they had 600 
um, one rep max, max effort attempts at hitting that ball. And now, now you have them and you're in the gym and you say, I have an idea. Let's rig up a way to stress the exact same tissues. I love it. Not only just stress them, but let's overload them with external weights because the ball wasn't enough. Right. Okay? And then when you're done doing those two things, the next day, we're going to go back to batting practice. How well do you think the tissues that have been just fucking annihilated neurologically, physically, chemically are going to perform? And how does that affect the way that they learn how to swing a baseball? Dude, it, I love this conversation. It's, it's just such a, it's such a great conversation because it is something that I think people – if people were able to, to see my strength and conditioning programs, I think they'd be, they'd step back and say, wait, that's it. Like they get bored out of their mind. Yes. It's it's very basic. Like where are the, and again, it's one of those things. If you are a, if you're a young athlete and you walk into a strength and conditioning facility and your strength and conditioning professional is making you throw fucking punches and weighted punches and apparatus and telling you these movements are going to make you a stronger puncher, a more powerful puncher, this, that, and the other. It's a telltale sign. I mean, it's one of those things like you just said, you just spent all day punching as hard as you possibly could. Now you're coming in and doing weighted punches. Why? What are you going to do the next day? Same thing with, you know, and I think this is something that's starting to get a little bit out of hand. And I talked to kind of my, my neuroscientists about this a little bit that the quote unquote reaction training that, that people are doing and all this stuff. Oh, Go stand man. in front of somebody throwing a fucking <laughs> punch at your face. You've got all the reaction training you need. Yeah. I, I don't need to sit there and throw a tennis ball at you. I don't need you to touch targets. I need you to practice your like how many how many different things when I spar someone, believe you me, I I have enough goddamn target practice if if I'm not the targeted practice. Like you're that's, that's enough. And you're, how much can your nervous system handle? Right. And, and the rotational aspect, baseball and fighting, I think this is a good, good relationship when you're talking about this, right? I mean, look, if you really want to develop rotational power, a lot of that rotation, watch them on the heavy bag for 15 minutes with Henry yelling out cadences. Watch them ripping hooks into the bag. And now we're going to take them to the strength and conditioning facility. Now we're going to figure out a way to load up another dynamic rotational movement because fighting is dynamic specific. Oh, we just watched them do that for 15 minutes, high intensity. Like you said, probably 600 max effort rotational bouts of force development. Like, oh, man, let, let, let's get away from that. Let's figure out how to counter that. Let's figure out some anti-rotational carries, some movements, some things like that, that can even this out a little bit. Let, let's figure that out. Yeah, you don't know what the fuck you're talking about. You're just a PhD in exercise physiology. <laughs> right. No, I heard this okay. one guy tell me that the glute was inhibited. You know, it's so tiring to say the same shit over and over and over again. Right. And have the same people tell you you're wrong over and over and over again. I mean, how much, how much education did one need? Right. right. How, how many specialists have to tell you the same thing? Weighted pucks. Mm-hmm. You, you know that whole thing with weight? I don't know if you remember this in hockey, but at one point there was weighted pucks and you were shoot with these weighted pucks because you were supposed to get stronger at your shot. That was supposed to improve shoot. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So no, it doesn't. Number one, because you're doing something that is of such a, a, a specific neurological sequencing that to put load into it right. is to fuck up how your body does it. It's like when you're doing a weighted punch or you're, right. you're punching with, with, with things, it's like, Another good example in jiu-jitsu, this is, a, this is a very common thing in my years of training where the instructor has this belief that in the warm-up, they need to just annihilate the person right. because you have to get used to fighting when you're exhausted. When you're tired, as, right? You as, if you're tired. as if it's a decision, as if the person's like, well, I'm tired, but I am going to push through this because my coach said I have to. Right. Unless you have the energy systems, that doesn't work, dude. Right. It, it, it's not, yeah. So the idea that you annihilate the person, you exhaust their nervous system, you exhaust their reaction time, you exhaust their willingness to learn. And now you start teaching the intricacies of a, of a, you know, of a Kimura. Right. You're like, whoa. We just treat. Yeah. And that's exactly it. We just created so many bad habits there all in the, all in that aspect. And, and again, you see the same thing in fighting. It's, it's, that's, is what you're seeing. Somebody runs them down and then throws them onto the mats. 
and, and it's, again, I'm fortunate, man. It's like I said, Henry's a very smart guy. We have a, a wrestling coach, Greg Jones, Kami Barzini, guys that have been around it that have come from sort of that collegiate, you know, collegiate wrestling coaching scene and very successful careers where like they get it. They understand periodization. They understand those aspects of programming and volume and what's too much and rest and recovery. And it's, it, it's really a, a fortunate thing because I'll, I'll be honest with you. Like you said, with your BJJ co, you know, BJJ coaches and stuff like that, that have done that. That's not always the case in MMA. Mm-hmm. It's not, yeah. it's not always the case where, I mean, I think more has always been, or where less has always been, whatever, more has always been considered more, less has always been considered less, mm-hmm. rather than that idea that we've started to really, you know, less is more. Somebody mm-hmm. like pulling certain aspects of training, we're getting more in the aspects that we need and things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Speaking of, I know you're, I don't know what, what your time is like, so. I got about, about eight minutes. Okay, eight minutes. I want to bring this up because we didn't even talk, we talked a lot about other things, but you are at Sanford MMA. Right. And I, I've looked into it uh, because, uh, you know, it was Black Zillions, and I, I looked into Sanford MMA, and I see some names like Usman, uh, Chandler, who if you're yep. not a real fight fan, you would not know what kind of a fucking monster. Ten days away for him. He's fighting Benson Henderson in ten days. Crazy good fight, man. Yep. Crazy good fight. Uh, Michael Johnson, who, by the way, this I've always said to myself, when that dude is there, when he's on, that right. is one of the most technical fighters. Absolutely, man. His Muay Thai is a uh, Burmese python you guys got from 1FC. One, one yeah, I'm uh, saying double champ, man. And I'll tell you what, he's a – I mean, all the guys, obviously all the guys you're naming are, are killers, but – Ung La's a, a guy that I've been able to work with, I think, the past four or five fights and sort of, you know, really hone in this idea of him jumping between weight classes and things like that. But I'm telling you, that's a guy that right now it, it's – fight fans know him and fight fans know how dangerous he is, but he's a guy right now that can come into the UFC and compete with anybody. Absolutely. And he's so resilient and just so dangerous that I, I, right now – I find it hard to believe anybody's finishing him right now. I believe he's finding a way to beat anybody in the world at that middleweight division. When you're him or when you're Chandler, because I, I, what is the, like when you're at the top of the, of the food chain at Bellator, mm-hmm. that's a happier place to be at for a lot of these guys? I, I think right? so. Financially? Yeah, yeah, for sure. They, yeah. They, they do extremely well. The, the company takes care of them. Um, you know, I, I think it's just one of those things you really got to look at where you're at in your life and, family, financial needs, stability, things like that. Um, but it's not to say that, you know, with all of those guys, you know, they are, some of them are approaching some free agency. And, and this goes the other way too. Some of the high level mm-hmm. UFC guys are approaching free agency. The, I think the growth in the sport with Bellator, one championship and UFC has created more, com- more competition and more conversation than it has in the past. And so I think those are right now, you know, in my mind, your top 10 from all of those organizations are extremely competitive. I just think the UFC right now, outside of that top 10, still has much, much more depth. Sure. I mean, that, and everyone, but the fact that there's these other places is so good for the yeah. fighters. And, and so uh, I, I, can't, I can't tell you with the amount of work that I know these fighters put in. I know all sports say that, but yep. It's 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 just a different level of um, sacrifice. Yep, no uh, doubt. About and the different level of sacrifice when you factor in CTE, which we didn't get to, but we will hopefully on the next round. And we factor in what you know you lose in basketball. You know, oh oh no. Mm-hmm. If you haven't been, and and I get we talked about this with fighting. I almost think that all people should have to fight at some point in their life just to just to understand where you are. Because if you haven't fought, you're the toughest guy in the world. And believe me, when you have fought, you realize that you were so goddamn wrong. It's like street fighters. I love that, right? Yeah. I don't do jujitsu. I'm a street fighter. So you've trained twice. Yep. Yeah. I train every goddamn day. Kamaru Usman has been training since he, since he remembers remembering. That's how many times he trained fighting. So don't tell me that your magic groin strike. Did you ever sit with people who don't fucking know about fighting? Yeah. And they're watching Kamaru and they're like, this guy's fucking bored. I just fucking hit him in the nuts. How often have you trained this magical nut kicking fucking technique? Right. No, you're, you're exactly right, man. It's everybody knows. And that's the thing. People don't understand. I, I, they don't get it. I mean, you know, they just want to, 
they're, they're experts until, until they find out. I mean, I just couldn't even, and here's the thing people talk about sometimes like Kamaru style compared to, I'd rather be knocked out in 10 seconds than have somebody completely just manhandle me for 25 minutes. Please. Nobody, is it, nobody, dude, push me up against the fence for 10. You want to die. It's yeah. the, right. It's so mounted against the fence. I don't understand. You know, it's funny. I, 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 I want to get to the Sanford thing. But one thing is that when you go to an MMA, a gym and you see a newbie, especially when he's a huge tatted, like fucking huge guy, right, I right. always get like a 14 year old, like blue belt. Right. Like, Fuck that guy up. And, and watching grown men tap when no submission has been applied, just the fact that someone's sitting on top of them and the panic in their eyes is, I think everyone needs to see that shit, man. Exactly right. I got Everyone it. needs to punch and get punched. I tell my kids, I've been training my kids since they've been breathing, right? Right. And I keep telling them, you don't want to fight, not because I know you don't want to hurt people, you want to be a good person, but it's fucking painful. Yeah, for if, sure. If you win the fights, you're out for months. Like it's yeah. it's this is not a fun activity. You know what I mean? And the emotions associated with it. Uh one of my clients, good friend and a business partner, Chris Algieri, uh boxing fans would know who he is. Yep. Former WBO champ, uh, two-time kickboxing champ. So he's a multi-sport Multi combat sport, sport, yeah. world champion. You know, has fought the likes of like Amir Khan, Manny Pacquiao, all of those guys. And, you know, still still working his way back up. I think he's about one fight away from, from fighting again for the title that he never actually lost. He had to vacate to move up in weight class to fight Pacquiao. Yep. Um, and, it, you know, it's funny, his last fight – and every fight I've been with him, he's one of those guys, you know, he's so calm, cool. He's such a, he's such a maniac in his preparation. Then fight week, he's so calm, cool, and collected. Everything held in, doesn't, no poker face, no tell, just good energy all the way around. Goes out and always fights like a savage the way he does. His next three days are just waterworks, man. He's just, uh, just an emotional wreck. Like, you don't know if he's going to come up. You don't know if he hates you. You don't know. Then next thing you know, he's telling you how much he appreciates having you around. And then he starts crying and this. And you're just like, man, this, it's just such a, it's such a roller coaster. But then again, I think a lot of that, too. You look at him the next day. Fuck, he's beat up. His eyes are black. He's got glasses on. He's, you know, the first elephant man. man. You look like the elephant man. Like, your face is fucking... Yeah, first beer he has and his blood thins out, all of a sudden you'll just see blood come running down his face. You're like, Jesus, man. You look like a psychopath. You're crying on one side, you're bleeding in the other. I got to get to this. I got to get to this last question and I'll let you go. So Sanford MMA, uh, I think I've been trying to get to this question for the whole time. Sanford okay. Sports in general, I'm interested because this is a, a, a health conglomerate. Right. Yeah. It's very new for me too. I mean, I've always worked in partnership with with Henry Greg, and those guys through my own independent company, Peacock Performance. Um, so the strength and conditioning job was really recently just offered to me once they kind of developed the position and all those things. So I'm learning still a lot about the process as well. But essentially, Sanford Health is a healthcare system primarily up in sort of the Dakota area, North Dakota, South Dakota, and that kind of thing. I, you know, I think if you go up there and you go up to a lot of the universities and stuff like that, med schools and stuff, you're going to see Sanford health all over the place. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's really, really big and, and dominant up there. So I think they're trying to expand their reaches and uh, they've recently, they have a Sanford sports performance thing where they've done a lot of interesting research in, in combat sports, CTE, brain health and stuff like that. So I think the partnership of Sanford, they, they've always had a partnership with like, Michael Chandler, Luke Rockhold, certain guys like that, where they've just sponsored them. Logo on the shorts, you know, golf outings, things like that. Normal sponsorship stuff where they've taken a more interested role. They've provided a, basically a director of medicine. They have some management, um, social media, and have built out an amazing, amazing state-of-the-art facility down here in Deerfield Beach. So we're still really in the new stages of this process um and, and it's a it's a really cool thing in my mind like the opportunity that's going to be able to come from this because here i am already actively researching and, and you know currently have a grant open looking at cte and markers of cte and brain health and mm -hmm. nfl players fighters and stuff like that but here they are collecting live data up there at some of these smaller shows there's a promotion called legacy fighting championships mm -hmm. they collect all of their data live prior to after concussion testing blood work and stuff like that so it's 
really going to open up a lot of cool avenues where I think with the resources that they have, and I think the experience and fighters that I have from my aspect of health and longevity, I think it's going to be a really cool thing. Outside of that, I mean, the fights, the, the team's just laced with, with killers and fighters. Unbelievable so, list. I, I think it's going to be a, I mean, in my mind, it, it's set to, to really take over the sport. I mean, a I lot of people are going around. Yeah. Gym of the year, it, it seems like it's coming up, man. When you see the, the list of people, the champions that you guys have, I mean, what a team, man. There's some excitement, man. And now you got guys like, you know, Anthony Rumble making his comeback and stuff like that. So, Serious yeah. puncher in the world. Dude, the guy, yeah, exactly yeah. right. You know, we talked about guys like Kamaru and their grind and their pace, and you got somebody like Anthony that's got that, and you're done. Lights up. We got, next, next conversation, maybe it's just going to be a, a, a fun uh, discussion about fights because we could do that as well. I mean, uh, you know what? So uh, I know you got to go. You're busy, man. Where can they find you? People should find you. And if you're a, if you're a BJJ, you know, if you're an amateur person, if you're, you want to find Corey because you have a PhD in exercise physiology, a specialist in the exact things that are going to make you better at what you're trying to do and safer. So how do they find you? I think easiest thing, go to social media, Instagram, Dr. C. Peacock, sort of active, not as much. I also have my website, peacockperformance.com. Yep. If you are, let's say, an aspiring student, that kind of thing that's out there really looking for the educational component, how to become a sports scientist, exercise science, um, definitely look at Nova Southeastern University, um, the program director, associate professor there. So we have a undergraduate and a graduate program, and the graduate program is brand new this year. First, first year that we've done it, crazy time to actually do it as well to be able to push this out in light of the COVID. But uh, if you're a student and that's something you're looking for, working under this experience, I mean, our laboratory is dynamic. Uh, myself, I have a guy, Dr. Jose Antonio, if you're familiar with the International yeah, Society. I, am familiar with it, yes. um, I mean, we're pumping out a lot of research there. So academics, definitely take a look at that. And as, as you alluded to, if you're a young aspiring fighter, mixed martial artist, BJJ, um, Samford Health, Sanford MMA, or just look at me on social media, and I think I can answer all your questions there. Brilliant. Uh, it took a while to get this done, right? But we did it. Oh, man, we're busy. So that's and a good we broke thing. the seal, so we'll do, we'll do several more. Right. Okay, and I will be watching uh, for all of your upcoming fighters. One right. day we'll be in a room watching fights together again, sir. Exactly right. Next week we got Michael Chandler, we got Adam Borix, and we got right. Matt Mitrion. So... Oh, Matt Mitrione, that's right. You have him too. Love Matt Mitrione, man. That's just looks like, just looks like a guy I want to hang out with in a room. Eh? Just like a cool, just a fun dude. Me, me, me with my football background, that's the guy because that's the same thing. He's an NFL guy forever. So, yeah, yeah. Awesome guy, man. So, all right. I look forward to it next Brilliant. time. Thank you so much, sir. We're going to talk to you soon. All right, buddy. Take care. Later.